As the emperor had recovered, he set out about 6 o'clock in the morning, June 30th. Many of the inhabitants who were outside of the gates cried, Viva la Pur! As the carriage started, we took the road to the park. Toward the middle of the day, we passed through Little Town, where there were a number of willing women selling fruit. The emperor stopped the carriage and told me to buy him some pounds of cherries. While I went to one of the dealers, the carriage was surrounded by people who looked closely at the strangers, but the emperor, to escape the curiosity not to be known, had his hand on the cheek, which was visible, and seemed to be asleep in his corner. As soon as we were outside of the town, he and his companions took great pleasure in cooling their mouths as I saw by the cherry stones which they threw out, it was a little distraction from the weariness of the journey. The emperor stopped to St. Amand, or Chateau Renault, a village, a little town, eight or ten leagues before Tour. Tell the truth, I do not know whether it was in one of these towns or in another, but there was a relay. I recollect that the inn where the emperor's stop was situated on the right hand in a narrow street, which was the principal one of the town. It might have been nine o'clock. The mistress of the house conducted the travelers into a room upstairs where they settled themselves. They were waiting for their dinner to be served when some police officer came to ask for their passports. One of the generals, the Duke of Rovigo, I think, went out of the room and showed them, but as they were not in very regular form, there was a somewhat long discussion which ended after some explanations. The police officers, being satisfied and having retired, the Duke came back, the dinner was served, and the travelers began to eat. When the Emperor died and rested a little, he went down out of the room with his companions to get into his carriage again, the inn kitchen through which he had to pass was full of people as he appeared everyone drew his side and made room for him to pass and hardly was he in the carriage and cries of viva la Pur! were heard both from the people who were inside and from groups which had been formed in the streets who had made the emperor's presence known perhaps the police officers themselves perhaps some old soldiers i saw some windows that were illuminated between this place and tour, there are woods on both sides of the road. We were rolling along without any other noise than that of the carriage on the pavement when, about halfway, I heard the distant gallop of horses coming near and near. I informed the emperor shortly afterwards. I saw two gendarmes who came up to the door and asked very politely if we had seen or heard anything. They explained to us that there were bandits in the neighborhood who stopped and robbed travelers. When we replied that nothing had happened to us and that we had not heard anything, they went away saluting us and wishing us a pleasant journey. We arrived at the post house in Tour in the middle of the night. It is on the right on the road to Blois. The emperor sent the Duke of Rovigo to the prefect. When the horses were hitched up, we passed the bridge at an office which was in the first house on the right on entering the town. They asked for our passports, which were visa immediately. And then we reached the other end of the town. Outside of the gate, the emperor had the carriage stopped and got out. We waited there nearly a quarter of an hour, and the Duke of Rovigo joined us with the prefect. Both went away with the emperor to a long distance, 20 yards from the carriage, and began a conversation. During this time, the Grand Marshal and General Becker remained in the carriage, talking about indifferent matters. The emperor's interview with the prefect lasted nearly an hour. When the emperor came to get into the carriage, the prefect said farewell to him and kissed his hand. We continued our journey. During the morning, a quarter hour of a league from Poitiers, the emperor stopped the carriage and went with the other gentlemen into the little house of a villager on the right, some 20 yards from the road. He asked for a glass of cool water, which I served to him after asking the woman of the house to give me a glass. He came back afterwards to his carriage, which had remained on the road in the care of the postillions, got into it. We reached the town where the emperor lodged in an inn beyond and near the post house. He had breakfast served. We remained in the inn during all the great heat of the day. Towards two or three o'clock, we set out again. On leaving the town, a sentry asked for the passports, which were returned to us almost immediately. We went towards New York. During the journey not far from New York, there was rather a long hill to ascend. The sun had just set. The emperor and the other gentlemen had got out and were following a few yards behind the carriage. A man who seemed to be a farmer was walking on the right of the road. From time to time as he went, he would glance at the emperor and look at him with a good deal of attention, edging over in my direction. He came near me, who was close to the carriage, and said, Who are these gentlemen? 
They are officers of high rank who are going to New York. I don't know, he replied at once, but there is one of them whom I seem to recognize. Certainly have seen him somewhere. Monsieur, that's very possible. At every step we took, the farmer turned his head in the direction of the one who excited his curiosity and examined him more attentively. I have no doubt that he had recognized the emperor. When we had got to the top of the hill, the travelers got into their carriage again, and we started on.